Good afternoon, Hopkinson, and welcome to the Monday, November 30th edition of the Hangout Hour, which I believe will be the last Hangout Hour in November, because today is the last day of November. So after this, we're into the last month of 2020. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Today, we have two half hour segments for you. The first is Act, uh, Ask the Chief, which uh, Chief Bennett is here. And our second half hour will be Meet the Freedom Team, which is a really interesting new team that's happening in Hopkinton. So I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and a long weekend, and I welcome you back. And Chief, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Jim. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend and uh, you got to enjoy the, the weather we had. Uh, yes, a lot of people did. I did. It was very quiet. Uh, however, I am so grateful that a vaccine is in the pipeline. So we know that we're having a, a very small and very distant holiday season this year, but it should only be one. Then by 2021, we will be back to normal. Whatever that is, Jim. Looking forward to seeing what that is. Yeah, I know. I know. Me too. All right. So, um, and I and I hope that you also enjoyed enjoyed the time. I did. It was small and quiet, but uh, it was very enjoyable. Okay. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So, I am really happy. I am really, really happy and grateful that when we asked you about coming on the show and doing segments where it's Ask the Chief and uh, kind of get updates and, and talk, talk about what's happening. You not only said, absolutely, you said you would be up for a regularly scheduled segment. So thank you so much for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think it's important uh, for people to hear from the police chief and to be able to ask questions and learn about their police department. I agree. I agree. You know, there's, um, there's a lot going on in the world today on many different fronts and I think that you guys perform a uh, very important service to our community and to our society. So it is great to be able to talk about that. So just so people know, we are targeting the last Friday of every month. We will have a Ask the Police Chief segment. So, so Chief, actually the first thing that I'm interested in is how is it going? Because you, you just become chief fairly recently. Yeah, it was great. I became chief in April, you know, during the pandemic and then moved into <clears throat> our summer, which was brought a lot of attention on law enforcement and the roles and responsibilities. But Jim, I can tell you that through hundreds of conversations, uh, I sit before you with a lot of pride in this organization, a lot of pride for the hard work that uh, the chiefs before me and those men and women that have moved on and retired and, and the men and women that are still here uh, have accomplished. We are, we're not playing catch up. We're, 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 we're way ahead of the game and these issues are not new to us and we've addressed, we've addressed them. So uh, proud to be here, proud to be your chief. Excellent, that's great. And it's really nice that you mentioned that because I say that all the time. Hopkinton is such a great place to live. And in a lot of my contacts, I deal with nonprofit um, community groups and you know they do a lot just lifting our our community you know just last week we had on the HPTO and they do amazing work along with along with many other ones however there are also town institutions police department the fire department DPW town hall and not only do you all of you contribute to this wonderful place that we live but you're also, forgive me, you're also great people. You're, you know, I talk to you all and you're very approachable and you're very happy to talk about what you do and you do really amazing things for the community. So that out of the way, let me just say, I'm just here. Um, how long have you been involved in the police department here in Hopkins? Well, I came here in uh, July of 1993. So this is my 27th, 27th year. And uh, it's been a great experience for me. I was given a lot of opportunity. I had great, great um, mentors and leaders to learn from. Uh, we have a fantastic training program here in the department and uh, I, I, I owe my success and most of us do to uh, just being such a progressive organization and, and valuing 
people. Really, we are a caring department and we look out for each other and care for each other. We care for the community. Uh, you know, it's just a great place to work. It's been nothing but my pleasure, my honor. You know what? I, I just have to say that July 1993 was a great month and not just because that was the month I got married. I just think it was <laughs> a great month. <laughs> Right. But considering I had two two children and no job, I was really excited to start work here. <laughs> After going through the police academy on my own and had no income for four months, so uh, wow, very excited. Yeah, yeah. Now you know what you've used the word progressive and you've used the word community. So I would like to just like let's get into that for a couple of minutes and talk okay. about. It. I know you were on a show recently. And I saw you talking with uh, one of the people that you work with, and I can't remember what her title is. Um, Was it Ashley? Yes. So, yep, Ashley is our, she's part of our jail diversion program, and she's a master's level clinician, which means she has a master's degree, and she, she, uh, she's amazing. Okay. So, and how long has her position existed? So, we're in our fifth year with that program. That program comes from uh, a partnership with Ashland, Sherburn, and Holliston, um, and is funded through a grant. So the cost to our community here is very minimal. And uh, we're in our fifth year, and, it, and it, it's just amazing to watch what that program has done for the community, for the officers, and for um, the family and the support system and structure for, uh, for the people that go through crisis. Mm. I think that with what she does and with what, what that position is for five years, really, that is really ahead of the curve and really predicting some of the uh, social conflict that's been happening in today's world right now. So, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've been on, I've sat on some panels with some major cities. Uh, they're, they're looking at this model as, something that's going to really end up going throughout the country and probably beyond. But, uh, you know, we have, we have data, we have, uh, we could collect data every month on uh, diversions from the hospital uh, when we're able to keep the person in the community. Um, and uh, the numbers, the numbers are there and the numbers support, support it, that there is a valuable need for it. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, in what I've been reading in the past few months, it's really amazing that as time has gone on over the past several decades, when there has been a need in the community, oftentimes the answer has been, send the police. Send the police to, to handle that situation and to figure that out. And it just seems to me that the number of different things that all of you would have to be trained to do really kind of unreasonable and having people on staff like Ashley really brings a new dimension to your force and to your department that that maybe that you wouldn't have some other way. Absolutely. It also uh, gives us the, the education and the training that we need to better handle the calls when she's not there. I mean, we don't have 24 seven partnership uh, with with the clinician, you know, that would be great. I would love to embed it. I'd love to have one embedded on every shift, mm -hmm. but um, the fact of the matter is it is a cost with it. And the town has supported um, wellness in the community. Uh, I know that youth and family services saw a big increase in their budget and uh, growth in staff. But uh, what, 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 I, what most impresses me is the way that working with Ashley side by side with the clinician and the clinicians that were here before her, um, it really taught something you can't teach in an academy. You know, that the way you communicate with someone in crisis that is used to being, they might have a mental health history and they used to be spoken to in a certain way and certain questions that are appropriate and maybe others that aren't. And the officers learn that by watching and then they actually do it and, and they feel more comfortable and they're not resorting to the things on their gun belts like their handcuffs. And they're able to de-escalate the situation better, evaluate the situation better, 
write better reports to support the, the doctors who might need to evaluate them at the hospital if, if Ashley's not there. So it really has this complete paradigm shift in the way we handle substance abuse and mental health problems. Um, it, it really is. It, I, I could go on for hours about this, but it's the most exciting thing really in, in, in the industry. I, I really, I think it's amazing myself and uh, I'd love to have you go on for hours about it because I think that this is a whole new facet of the work that you do that is very much under a microscope currently and to see that, you know, this has been going on in our community for five years working to, uh, to help this situation and divert, divert people from going to jail. It's, I think it's great. I think it's really great. Now, yeah. I do have a couple questions ha are, are here, so I'd like to jump into some great. of them. We're going to chat more if we have time. No, that's great. All right, so uh, here's an uh, interesting one. Scams and fraud traces, fraud cases, are they increasing during the holidays, and what are you seeing? So we're, the unemployment scam is we're getting six to 10 of those a day, uh, and we're learning that, and it was on the news, uh, that they're being... Uh, a lot of they'd be coming out of the jails. The prisoners are requesting unemployment benefits fraudulently. Uh, most of those don't res result in any payout because the employer gets contacted and, and as a result, it gets declined. Um, we've had people here uh, that have that have uh, almost been victims and uh, people in my family have, have almost been victims, but we don't see money going out. Uh, what I would caution everybody right now about scams is uh, a lot of Facebook stuff and uh, and the exchange and open market type stuff um, to be very careful. I just read a report before I clicked on this. Someone sent some, uh, an item to the, to the buyer without getting paid. And then the, now the buyer's nowhere, nowhere to be found. Uh, the other, the, another big thing is when you're going to do an in-person exchange, I welcome you to come down to the police station here. We have a, we have a, we have spaces out front. Some of them, one of them actually designated as a safe exchange zone where you can come down, you're on camera. It's not likely someone's gonna to try to rob you in a police station parking lot. And, uh, <laughs> and we will catch them if, if they do try. Right. <laughs> so uh, definitely be careful. Well, I just, I just, yes, I wanna give a shout out to my mom. I'm so proud of my mom. Uh, so Chief, this last weekend, she's telling me, she got a phone call, says it's a grandson, he's got a cold, so it sounds a little different. He was in an accident. And he's at the police station and needs her to wire her some money. And my mom said, oh, really? Okay. But what's your birthday? Boom. He hung up the phone. And that was <laughs> Good for her. I want to give her a big trophy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, those uh, grandparent scams are terrible. They, they prey on, you know, the grandparents' willingness to support. We see that a lot around spring break. Uh, where the student get the, the, gets arrested allegedly and needs money for bail. We, uh, probably the most complex one we saw was they said that uh, there, were, there was an active FBI case against a woman and she had to pay off uh, the victim um, or the, unless the case was going to go forward. Uh, police agencies don't negotiate deals with victims and, and, and <laughs> criminals. We don't, we don't exchange money amongst people. That, uh, and, uh, you know, it's the same thing with the IRS. The IRS will never call you. They will never call you. Um, so. And also, too, I just hope that people can understand that this is not them. You know, when somebody gets called and if they fall prey to a scam, it's not a shameful thing. I've read stories about where people, they get embarrassed about it and it, it goes on longer. And no, it's really, it can happen to anybody. And there's no shame in that. And no. the, more they, the sooner that they can ask for help, the sooner they can get it. Well, it, there's, there's tactics to it, right? There's always going to be a sense of urgency that, you, that needs you to act quickly. And before you can gather your thoughts or reach out to someone, they'll try to isolate you. Say, don't, don't call anybody, you know? Um, and it, 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 it comes at them very fast and they, they don't really have a chance to truly evaluate it, even though they, a lot of times they do feel this doesn't sound right, but they're, they're, they're very manipulative and they know how to control people on the phone, and, yeah. you know, and, and if one out of a hundred works, yeah. you know, that's it's right. very that's lucrative, no. very lucrative. So. All right. Um, moving on to, to the next question. Somebody's asking if you can talk a little bit about the 
Toys for Tots. What's happening with that? And as oh. you think about that, Mike has a picture he's going to be sharing with us. So go ahead, Steve. Okay, great. So Toys for Tots is a really exciting program. The, the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps works. There you go. Yeah. Um, that box is full. Um, almost every other day that box gets full. Uh, we, we, as I said, uh, we're a caring department and we, we represent, we, we kind of mirror the caringness, caringness of our community. Uh, there's a lot of very generous people in our community and they, that box gets filled and it'll be overflowing. Sometimes the dispatchers have to call um, might to come down and empty it. And uh, he's yeah. always there. It's a great yeah. program. We're here, we'll come in. You can fill up our whole lobby with it. We'll take care of it. And that's where the box is, in your lobby. In the lobby, you can come right in, um, drop the stuff off and wave to the dispatcher and uh, say hello if you want. And uh, glad to have you. That's great. That's really great. And new toys, unwrapped, uh, do you know how long it's going for? Yeah, they, they, they're looking for new toys, yes. Okay, um, let's see. Police logs report a lot of gunfire in town lately. Do you, do you know about that? <laughs> so, um, you know, depending on the weather, atmospheric conditions, the gunshots from our gun clubs can travel. Uh, we have three gun clubs in town and, have, and two of them are very, very active. Uh, there was, I've only, almost always when you hear where the call is from, you know which gun club it is. Uh, but we've had, we, we have, very good history of safety in the community as far as shooting shoot gun clubs and as far as hunting uh, so uh, please do call we, we want every call uh, by the nature of the your department that that has been built for you we want you to call for anything because we are a service department we just assume you went back to enjoying your life and and we went and checked the area and you know you're safe and everybody knows you're safe so no matter what it is always call let me ask you about that. So there are a few gun clubs in town. Are those at specific locations or do they have like, can they, I don't know, do they have like meets where they can meet in different different areas or is it always in a designated spot? Sure. So we have one on Lumber Street, uh, the Sportsman's Club, the Southboro uh, Fishing Game or Rod and Gun Fishing Game, I think it is, is down on the town line on this side of the river. And um, <clears throat> the Sportsman, oh, the Woodville Rod and Gun is down on Route 135. And they their ranges are open various times, but usually it's like sun up to sundown. I know that the Sportsman's Club and the Southboro Club do do some nighttime trap and skeet shooting uh, where they have they've lighted up and they and they shoot uh, at night. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, the sound travels. So, uh, you know, the one, what's, what's more odd when you hear like one shot at night, you might hear, someone that is hunting at night and taking the game animal at night, which is which is legal for certain species. Mm. Um, so I don't know this. Where can people hunt in town? So um, anywhere, so anywhere that's not posted, uh, the fruit street fields are posted. So you, you can't hunt down on that property. But uh, you know, there's, uh, let's say you own 30 acres unless you post it, a hunter could come onto your, your land and hunt. Uh, so if that's something uh, that you're opposed to, then, then you need to just let them know uh, so they so they can stay away. Wow. And then there's distances to the home. You have to be you know 500 feet from a home dwelling when you discharge your firearm and distance from the road. There's, yeah. there's a lot of regulations that, that, they, that they fall under as well. Right, and I assume there's a season for that? There is, and actually, we're moving into the busiest season where you're going to see truck loads, trucks of people. Not to be stereotypical, most likely trucks. They could be cars, but um, you know, uh, is Monday morning. Um, today actually is the opening of uh, of deer season, so uh, you're going to see people out there in the early morning, parked on the side of the road, and coming out, uh, ho hopefully wearing their orange clothing, and. Uh, while they're out there, I, I would recommend anybody that goes out to the woods to wear bright, bright clothing to make it safe. A lot of hunters hunt from stands, which is probably the safest practice, but other hunters do do work from the ground. And, you know, we're all safer if we're bright when we're bright clothes out in the woods. Right. So I'm just 
Now, I'm just curious about this. Um, if a hunter can, can walk around and hunt anywhere, as long as it's not posted, what, what, do they, what do they do? What do they know so that they're not shooting towards uh, um, a housing development or something like that? Sure. So uh, there's, there's a few things that go into that. Every person that discharges a firearm should expect to know what's behind what they're shooting at and should be shooting in a manner that is safe. So um, the other thing that, that goes with that is we're a shotgun hunting state which the range of a shotgun is, is a fraction of a rifle. So that bullet will hit the ground at you know, some number of hundreds of yards, whereas a rifle can travel you know, accurately up 600, 800 yards, uh, high powered rifle. So uh, the shotgun makes it, makes, does make it safer. But uh, that being said, there's a lot of responsibility on the hunter to ensure that when they take that shot, that there's nothing behind the, the animal that they're, they're trying to harvest. Right. Okay. All right. Um, moving on. There's a question about a parking ban in town. Yep. So we have a winter parking ban to help uh, the highway department uh, no, starting in November 15th. And I'm remembering that I haven't actually written a parking ticket in a long time, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, uh, November 15th. And uh, so no overnight parking on the roadways. And then what that does is it allows the, the, the town to clean the roads and not have to go around your car and leave that mess uh, when, when the person pulls out. Uh, people in town are very good about it. Uh, the officers will give out warnings in the beginning just to educate the public and, uh, and then they will write tickets, but we, we'd rather just people become educated and we don't really don't like writing residents parking tickets in front of their houses. <laughs> so I'm just curious, now, is that a significant issue in our community? I can understand in Boston, but there's very little parking and everybody is all that stuff there. But in our community where we're much more rural, is, is there a, is there an issue with that or? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's the same question that could be applied to a lot of different things, right? The expectation placed on the highway department is that the roads will be clear. There's a very high expectation of, of care for the roadways. And in order for them to do that, they need to support the residents and not park on the road. Um, right. And I think the most important thing is to know. Like, I, I was really surprised this year when that snow, that freak snowstorm came. I had no idea. I, I got to check the weather more often so I know what's coming. I'm going to send an alert on my phone or something, right? <laughs> they must have something for that. You can do that, right, Chief? You want to send uh, some kind of contact that comes to all of us. I'm, I'll work on I'll look at that. <laughs> uh, Sounds like an emergency management group type of message. Okay. Now this next one, I don't think is a question, but I think is uh, somebody who may have been involved in looking for just a little discussion of it. Um, I know that the police have worked with the DTE department up the high school with Doug Scott, and um, they're often uh, going in there and meeting with his classes, talking about solutions to first respond to problems. So um, do you have any update on, on, on that? program and Mike has another picture for us too. Okay. <laughs> That's great. So when was this? Was this last? So yeah, there was a, and I can't, and the, yeah, Flipgrid, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the be beginning of November, um, Mr. Scott started this, this program with Flipgrid and it's an app that's really easy to use. And the students put together a series of questions. They each posed questions to law enforcement and different members of the department would click on them and do a short video clip uh, answering the question. Uh, a lot of it had to do with our equipment and um, our gun belt and how that impacts, uh, impacts us over time, uh, uh, you know, and what could be done to mitigate some of that impact. And one of the things that, uh, you know, the vest carriers where the offices wear, uh, they wear their, some of their tools on their ballistic vest. Um, is the purpose of that originally was was done because of alleviating the strain on the on the hips and the back from the gun belt. So not only does it put that downward pressure on your hips, but it also makes you sit awkwardly in the car. So if we can move stuff off our back and have a good alignment and good posture, and you know not driving all that weight down on our hips, 
uh, longevity. If you were to bring on some of the, your friends who have retired from the department, they'll tell you, yeah, my hips kill me. You know, um, some have had replacements and, uh, and, and it's a good innovation. Uh, and but that's that's where that was born out of and the students ate that up you know and then you know there were some questions like faster way to reload your magazine you know and uh, it was it, I really enjoyed it I, I did a few of them and uh, it was fun it's easy and Mr. Scott's amazing I mean he's yeah. we, we're, yeah. so, we're so lucky to have him yes and you know I was there at that program last year taking some video for Mr. Scott while I was doing it and I'll tell you what I'm really love about that is oftentimes you know people in the community you can be intimidating you know you have like you have this uniform you got this belt that's like bigger than batman's i don't even know what you have in that right and you have the you have the shield like you can be a presence and to see a group of you talking to the high school students about real world problems and they're getting involved in it you know they're not really they're not really saying you know, there's a police officer here. They're like, this is a person that, you know, we're like working together on something. I don't want to say, I don't want to say like humanizes you because, you know, you're all, we're all humans, but it's really nice to see an interaction like that because oftentimes people see you when they're at their worst, you know? That's right. And we also want them to feel comfortable calling us and calling on us. You know, if we're, if we're somebody that just drives by in the car you know, there was the old professional police model and dragnet style, just the facts, ma'am. You know, yeah. uh, that doesn't work. You know, no one's going to call that guy to tell him that something tragic happened to him. Right. And we learned that Well, people before my time learned that. And we moved to this community policing model. And what it's about is really just about building those relationships, gaining trust, which is everything. People need to trust that they can that they can call you. And it's and then to be you know proximity to be near us and see us just being us and in our uniform to know that you know yeah you know you see me like this all the time but i can put my game face on you know i get a pr pretty strong game face but i don't that's not my role today you know so um we we are trained to do that but we also trained to be a part of the community to engage the community to build trust and 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 you can you know enough of the officers. That's what we look for in our officers. We look for someone who's going to be engaging, who's going to fit in the community. That's the first and foremost. Um, you know, we, yes, we do have someone working in the building that scored the highest on our test. Yeah, yes, and all of them did really well academically and on their tests and on their interviews. But what really gets them the job is is that fit. You know. Yeah, that's a real evolution of that. I know when I was a kid. And I would go slightly above the speed limit. Maybe like a police officer pulled me over. They were very serious people, you know? And I know you, you have a very serious job and I'm not belittling that. No. It, it, like in today's world, you're so different then. And it'd be really interesting to talk about it next time about this because compared to the population, there have to be so, so many less of you today than there were back then as the population has grown and everybody's sharing everything on the internet. I'm often saying, why does Reader's Digest tell these stories about what bad people are doing? This gives other people ideas. It must be horrible. But anyway. Well, if I could add, just the other big thing of that is, you know, unfortunately we see a lot of bad in people, that in good people, right? We see good people at their worst day. And by having that broad range of encounters with the public it helps us from getting jaded you know in this job if you're only seeing people in their bad days when they're being cruel to their family when they're whatever they're doing right um that can that can make for a long career it can change a person but when you go and you hang out with some high school kids and they're excited because their project is, is going so well or they they smile because they're just sitting talking to you that that it's good for the soul. That, that's how, that's what gets you through a career, you know? Yeah. That, I'd like to pick that up next time because I think that is fascinating. It's, it, that's a really great topic. Yeah. Before we wrap this up, I just want to give you an opportunity. Uh, I'm sure Mike probably has a picture for this. You send out alerts. Is there a way for people to sign up if they want to get, you know, uh, breaking issues from you? Yeah, so we're, we're really 
pushing the Facebook uh, and Twitter for as a mainstream for our alerts. Um, yep, there you go. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so that's that's our number one way in today's society. We we do have a town wide code red system, but um, we find that the social media really is our best bet. And along the lines of alert, I want to just squeak this in there. This is a campaign we started years ago. Like it, lock it, keep it. Okay. Um, we, we did send an alert out. Um, there is a group of, of uh, young criminals that are stealing cars and breaking into cars all over the, all over Massachusetts. Uh, there's actually a task force that's been created to, to try to catch them. Uh, they steal the cars and bring them back to Connecticut. Uh, uh, the morning, uh, Friday morning after Thanksgiving, we, we were the victim of it. Uh, someone stole a car on, in, in the Oak Crest Road neighborhood and they went through some other cars. Subsequently, they were involved in a, uh, in a foot, foot pursuit in Hartford and they were arrested. Uh, you know, they, they don't break your stuff. They go through and steal your stuff. And if you leave your keys in your car, they'll steal it. And I'm sure they're not treating it really nice while they, while they have it. So, uh, you know, just, just lock your doors, you know, lock your cars, lock your doors. All right, Chief, thank you. And I know uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that on your next segment, but right now you can stick around because you're part of the Freedom Team. That's and right. other members who are joining us for this half hour segment, which we're going to be talking about what in the world is the Freedom Team and who's on it and what are you doing and what do you hope to do? So this is going to be a really good conversation too. All right, they're filing in is, let's see, uh, Kathleen, are you? Oh, hello. Hi, everyone. Oh, how are you? Good. How are you all? Good, thanks. Um, so, welcome for being here. And um, actually, you know what? We got we got some people here. So, how about each of you? Let's just run through, okay? And say hello. And if uh, you have a particular position on the Freedom Team. Um, whether you have, if you have a member or you have a title, uh, let's just let's just see who you are, and then we will uh, talk about what the Freedom Team is. So, Kathleen, you go first. All right, I'm Kathleen Dinsmore, and I am um, the facilitator and the one who brought the Hopkinton Freedom Team together. Perfect, Don. I'm Don Alcott Miller. I'm the director um, of Hopkinton Youth and Family Services, and I'm a part of the Freedom Team because we thoroughly support and believe in the concept and, and what it's doing in the community. Great. Cheryl. I'm Cheryl Peralt. I'm happy to be on the Freedom Team as a community member, and I am also happy to say I have connections with HCAM TV through the years and I'm happy to uh, connect uh, the two organizations together for uh, opportunities. Great, Shazane. Hello everyone, I'm Shazane Khan. I am a recent graduate of Hopkinton High School and I don't have a role on the student team, but recently I've been involved with direct, helping direct the uh, bonding activities and helping people get to know each other, so. Fantastic. Keith. Um, Joe Bennett, I'm your police chief. I'm really excited to be a part of the Freedom Team because uh, it uh, is another resource that uh, I can be a part of and share with people uh, that may have been harmed uh, by bias, but doesn't rise to the level of a crime. So I'm really excited to be a member of this team. Okay, welcome to you all. I'm so glad that you're here. So Kathleen, can you start us off with a little bit of history about how the Freedom Team came to exist? So uh, I first heard about the Freedom Team a few years ago from uh, Jamil Adams, who created the idea of having a Freedom Team. And he, the first Freedom Team that he formed uh, was a Natick, and that was around 2016. And um, I was very inspired by the, the purpose and his goal for a freedom team um, to essentially have a group of people in place 
who represent many points of the community so that if an incident arises in the town um, with bias, with um, prejudice or any sort of discrimination, that there would be a group of people there with various degrees of expertise and experiences to handle the situation, both on an individual basis and as a broader for the community. And so as Jamil likes to say, it's, it's essentially giving a hug to those who were harmed and to try to bring both sides together to try to um, listen to one another, to be heard, and um, perhaps to move beyond that in a positive way um, to heal the community. And so now there are three other freedom teams in the state. I hear that there are two more that have just recently been formed in addition to Hopkinton's. And um, so there's going to be a lot of collaboration among the different freedom teams, but also uh, the freedom team is here to collaborate with a lot of the community groups here in Hopkinton and um, to really move the conversation about bias um, and healing the division that we've been experiencing and, and embracing diversity in our community. Okay, great. Now we're gonna have just general questions and anybody who would like to um, can pop in and answer it. I'm curious, would you describe the Freedom Team as more reactionary to an event that has happened or whatever the, op whatever the opposite of that is? Um, or oh, trying to prevent something, bias or something. I'll, I'll answer it first. Um, it's both. So it, it's twofold. So it's, it's, we have a hotline that was just um, put online with tremendous help by um, Chief Bennett. And so anybody in the community can call that hotline. It's confidential. And if it's not crime related, then the chief refers it to the freedom team. And then we decide whether um, we want to take on this issue. And it would be a person who has been the victim of a incident of bias. And so the freedom team would have two or three people who would meet with that person. So in that sense, it's reactive, but on the proactive side, we want to bring the discussion and the education to the wider community. And so that's what we were um, starting to do with our uh, co connect, community connections. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Um, that we had without Metro West a couple of weeks ago where they gave a presentation on LGBTQ plus rights. And so we're going to be having a lot more conversations um, about different ways that we can educate ourselves and be more welcoming of the different um, groups of diversity in our town. Okay. So a couple of things you said there, really interesting. I'm sorry, Cheryl, did you want to pop in? Oh, well, I, I was just going to add that the founder of the Freedom Team, Jamil Adams, um, he had been uh, at HCAM Studio a couple of years ago as a feature for Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. And he was doing some of his talk there uh, about the ideas of lit, love, inclusion, and trust. And that is a big part of the uh, motto, uh, the idea behind Freedom Team as well. And for promoting uh, those uh, type of uh, values for community that also involves uh, providing opportunity for communication, promoting understanding of one another, uh, promoting opportunities for a community to get together and, and feel more bonding and bridge uh, with one another in a variety of ways. 
And I think we're, we're starting to explore that as we're all getting together from different places and being creative about that too. Yeah. All right. So I want to talk about the proactive, Kathleen, thank you for that word. I knew it's what I was working for, for the proactive aspect of the Freedom Team. I just wanted to follow up. I'm really interested. Kathleen, you said that if an issue is referred by um, Chief Bennett and if the Freedom Team takes up that issue and then they meet with them, I'm assuming is them the victim, the person who has suffered the act of bias? Yes, shaking your head. Yep. So um, who, who does that? Do you, have a, do you have a subset of the team or how does, that, how does that work? And what do you actually talk about with that person and, and what does the Freedom Team do? So it's based on a restorative or transformative justice model, uh, which is completely voluntary. And so it would depend on um, first the experiences or expertise of the um, different team members and who might be best suited to talk to this person with one or two other people and their availability and their willingness to participate. Um, and, and it's really to just provide a platform in a safe and confidential and secure space that um, can allow the person to be heard and, and to know that, they're, that the issue that happened to them is not just going to be brushed under the rug and forgotten. And so with the restorative justice model, um, it, the, the the purpose is to empower the person who was harmed, to um, make that person feel, uh, find a way to resolve this. Um, and that may look just going within and finding how to, um, just being heard may be enough, or it may be inviting the harm doer to the conversation. And again, that's voluntary. So the harm doer after being invited may refuse to participate um, or may choose to participate. And so it just it moves from there. Okay, thank you. Now, <clears throat> a lot of talk I have heard in, uh, in media and community about starting conversations. And when I look at that, I see two aspects. I'm curious on, curious for your thoughts on this. Um, I see there being said, we need to have a, a difficult conversation. And I also see we need to have events where we can come together and just share our, you know, our lives together. So, uh, who has any thoughts on that? I can speak a little to that. Um, I believe that the latter, they, they serve two different purposes, in my mind at least. So the latter serves the purpose of increasing the cohesion of the community in that you'd be able to eventually have those hard discussions relatively easier as opposed to talking with complete strangers. Um, it also gives a platform for a lot of people who have historically been uh, hesitant to have their opinions known, um, to have those opinions known and to share those opinions um, and to also engage with other people so that you can eventually have those more difficult discussions and conversations and come to terms with the reality of the situation in our country, in our community, in our lives and in our families are right now. So you see the events coming first, we get to know each other, we become comfortable with each other, and then we can go to a, a deeper relationship and a more serious conversation about what our society is standing for. Absolutely. I mean, there's, again, many ways to look at it because it's truly a multifaceted idea, but that's the linear way of looking at it. But the, these conversations are also, um, these are, you can have conversations happening outside of these events with people who are different stages of relationships with each other. So it's really a combination of a linear relationship with a parallel relationship. So it's just 
that sort of dynamic is, in my opinion, very beautiful. And in order to really um, encourage that dynamic and in order to really make that dynamic more apparent and more present in Hopkinton, um, events would definitely be necessary. Uh, I, and I do think that those are definitely important first steps to, uh, leading to the more, um, the la later stages of what social justice is. Okay. John, can you speak to me um, about why you're on the Freedom Team and um, what your passion here is? Sure. Um, you know, I'm a collaborator at heart, and I think that um, Huffington Youth and Family Services has been seeking to get to know different aspects of the community that don't always make a connection, and also to serve um, well with the social justice model that we have, and um, to um, always be culturally sensitive and humble and wise in our dealings with others. And, um, and I think that there's no, no lack of things we need to learn about each other and other people. We haven't arrived. We don't know what there is to know. There's always curiosity and inquisitiveness and um, that, that joy of getting to know um, people for who they really are. Uh, I think that's a privilege of the work that I do, um, that I get to know, but people in, in very deep ways, but the, um, the idea of people being free to be themselves um, and so that others have that joy too. I, I like that idea too. <laughs> so, um, and to give um, young people room and um, a platform from which to share about their own experiences and um, the ability to advocate and to have self-advocacy around things that have gone wrong and things that have um, been incredibly hurtful, disturbing and wrong. And, and to be able to say, look, this happened to me and um, I want a different community. And it's the young people that shift our communities often. And so to give them that power, that voice and to have safe adults to go to who share um, in wanting a a better environment for them and to be able to journey beside them and so that they can look to different people in the community and say, I have an ally here. And if something does happen, I can go to them and I can, you know, pick their brain about how to handle it and not have to do this all alone. That's great. I just want to say that in my life, I have been fortunate enough to be able to be myself. And when I hear you talk about people who don't have the space or you know don't have the opportunity to be themselves. I personally find that is one of the um, most problematic things about our society that people can would have to be in a space that they cannot be themselves, um, especially for um, you know younger people. It's just it's it's unconscionable. So I really applaud the work that you're doing, Chief. Why are you on? Why are you on the freedom team? What do, What do you? What, I know you're the you're the provider of the hotline. So, what do you look at the freedom team and become excited about? Oh, you muted. Thank you for muting when you weren't speaking. <laughs> well, I had a windstorm going on in the back of my office here. Everything was flying off the off the window. So, um, you know, personally, I'll stop personally. For me, just being around this group of people and being able to engage in conversation and learn and progress on my journey and to be able to speak in a safe space uh, has been so helpful for me. Um, you know, I, uh, I view the Freedom Team as just another, uh, if I can add, a, bring something small to this team, um, really what, what they do is beyond, way beyond me and what I can offer other than the hotline. Uh, and I mentioned the hotline, I want anybody that's thinking about calling to know it rings on my phone. So no one else will hear it. If it gets referred uh, out and it doesn't get investigated, it won't become part of any police record or document or anything. It'll be simply be a, a phone call from me uh, to the team and, and they'll contact you. But I'm also here for you if, if you wanna talk to me, but um, yeah, I, I just want to be some some small way participate and, and add something. But for so far, it's been me me learning and growing uh, with this team. And I, I want while I have you guys here, say thank you. All right. So uh, Mike's going to share 
um, Holland Ray. I so we have our own bat phone right to Chief Bennett. That that is amazing. That is amazing. All right. So there it is on. Uh, let's see. This is it the town's website. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. Now, um, that's great, Chief. Now, um, now I'm going to Cheryl. Cheryl is a person of words. And so um, I wanted to ask her if you would mind sharing a little bit about what you see yourself contributing to as part of the team of the Freedom Team. I think um, personally, I come with a lot of stories uh, myself from my life and where I grew up and with um, family who were wired in their minds not to be as inclusive minded towards different groups of people and have grown up with uh, a particular uh, type of uh, religion uh, as a child and different uh, subgroups where I learned a lot about uh, polarization uh, as a child and then uh, uh, growing up and becoming involved in psychology and working with children and families and then going into the arts and community arts and healing arts um, and most recently uh, in the area of storytelling, true storytelling, I uh, see how all of these intersect for me that I can have an awareness that we all come from different uh, life stories and experiences and contexts of where we're born. And that uh, feeds into uh, misunderstandings sometimes uh, that begin uh, as early as childhood and um, that we need more opportunities for listening and growing our awareness and understanding of one another in this world, especially now. And I've come to see how powerful in particular the arts and the community arts are. And I saw that happen uh, at HCAM Studios for 14 years uh, with uh, programs like Wake Up and Smell the Poetry where people could come uh, with very different lifestyles and experiences and way of looking at the world and represent themselves and be authentic and say, here's, here I am, here's my art, here's my story. And I've learned a great deal as a host of that, as well as the other satellite programs I got involved with uh, through the years. And, and so I feel I, um, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm an individual from uh, the boomer gener generation now um, as a part of the team, and I'm uh, from psychology background, working with children and families, and also the community arts, and, and knowing a lot of different community uh, people. I know there are so many stories, and, and we really need to better understand one another and have more opportunities to talk and listen. That's great. And by the way, I, you're, you're in the boomer generation. I'm actually Generation X, which drives my daughter insane uh, mm -hmm. that I'm not a boomer. <laughs> now, Kathleen, I'm going to show your website for a quick minute. I'm interested. How big is your team? Are you looking for more members? And uh, how would you recommend people get in touch with you? Okay. Yeah. So this is our website. Um, and Shazan was uh, one of the creators of our logo um, with the tree and and the message behind that. Um, currently, we have about 20 members. As I said before, they reach different aspects of the community. Um, and that is essentially our core group. We are still looking for um, uh, some a few more members to reach out to. Um, in case we um, have incidents of bias that come up that we feel would, would um, 
it could only help as we handle those situations. But we are opening the group up to general membership where they would um, be part of our mailing list of resources that we want to share. Um, as Chief Bennett had said, a lot of this work is looking in the mirror and really trying to push ourselves into these um, difficult topics and finding out where we stand. And so a lot of the um, membership would be uh, ha being part of that mailing list of the resources that we can share and offer, um, helping out with organizing various events or um, coming up with ideas for events, for fundraising, um, that sort of thing. So at this moment, um, we would invite anyone to go onto our website, which is um, hopkintonfreedomteam.org, and filling out a pledge, a pledge about um, what you want to do in terms of furthering um, social justice and um, welcoming diversity. And it can be a small thing or it can be a, a larger thing. And um, and and get involved, no matter how how insignificant you think it is. It really is significant because the ripple effect um, reverberates. And um, eventually, we'd like to have everyone in our town become a member of the Freedom Team and be part of this conversation. Excellent. We only have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have anything you'd like to mention uh, about an upcoming event or an upcoming activity or something that you're looking forward to the Freedom Team being a part of? What is that? Well, we have a, several things that are kind of simmering um, that we're trying to organize, but uh, we're looking to have a speaker or some sort of event on Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, and collaborating with one of the groups in town for that. And um, we are going to be having stories from immigrants, um, hopefully in the spring. Um, all of these are still in the planning stages, but as Cheryl said, it's really a, a matter of sitting down and hearing one another's stories and listening and, and trying to foster more understanding. And we'll have, we got good reception from our event without Metro West. And so there have been other topics that people would like to see us present. So we're certainly looking into that, but we're all about collaboration. And so we would love to work with like-minded organizations and individuals in our community and um, offer as many programs and difficult conversations as as we can oh, i would yeah. also um sorry to interrupt i would also um remind everyone that south asian circle of hopkinton is currently i believe in the middle of their hopkinton lights up as one event and i encourage everyone to partake in whatever um manner they can whether that be lighting up your house as you would for the holidays or just having a light in your heart and just trying to um, enlighten yourself you no know, matter of speaking about um, the various cultural celebrations that have happened or are happening right now and is there more can, saying, can i jump in can, can i jump in yeah absolutely <clears throat> so i asked this question so i know the answer but is there a wrong way to celebrate the light up event that we're in right now um i without writing personal... words but like white lights are okay colored lights are okay whatever you right I like mean... my station i use blue <laughs> in my police station right it's it yeah i couldn't nervous. imagine any sort of issues so i i encourage just light in general i'm yeah, yeah. exactly okay we are completely out of time Thank you all for being here. I really look forward to having you all back and talking about more of your activities. So I appreciate the work you do for our community. Thank you for watching. Hang out. Thank you.